Hello everyone, I'm Dr. William Shang, and thanks for taking time out today so we can have this very important discussion about the role of strength training as part of a total program to treat prediabetes and diabetes. Now most people know that when it comes to exercise, aerobic exercise, trying to lose weight as well as eating right are part of a SMART plan, an overall plan to fight prediabetes and diabetes. I'd like to talk with you today about an aspect which often gets overlooked and surprisingly most doctors never bring up. So it's kind of like going to take on last year's pennant winners, missing your, your MVPs in your lineup. So let's get started and take a look at the American Diabetes Association's recommendations for physical activity and type 2 diabetes. I've underlined in red those areas which I think we should focus on. I'll read it for you. Adults with type 2 diabetes should ideally perform both aerobic and resistance exercise. Jumping down, it says structured lifestyle interventions that include at least 150 minutes a week of physical activity and dietary changes resulting in a weight loss of 5 to 7 percent are recommended to prevent or delay the onset of type 2 diabetes in patients at risk and with prediabetes. So let's look at this slowly. The first take home message is that the ADA recommends people with type 2 diabetes as well as those who are at risk with prediabetes should perform not just aerobic exercise but aerobic and resistance exercise. They call for those who perform aerobic exercise to perform 150 minutes a week of physical activity with the goal of losing at least 5 to 7 percent of their weight. I think the other part that's important here is a structured lifestyle intervention. Structured meaning that it's not a random activity. And that's what I'd like to bring to your attention today. In order for us to do something which is worth accomplishing, we need structure. In other words, when we get in the car or we walk to or ride the bike to our local fitness facility, we have to have a structure. We have to have a design about how to go about getting better. The biggest mistake that I see among physicians and healthcare providers is that they seem to forget the second part of this ADA recommendation, which is resistance exercise. Now we're going to see in the next few slides why research has shown that resistance exercise is the best way of treating prediabetes and diabetes. So you may ask, how does the ADA know that resistance training or strength training is better than aerobic training alone? Well, like most things in medicine, we did studies. And I'm going to briefly show you three studies. And if you'd like, you can look up these studies. I'm just showing you the abstract. So here you can see the conclusion from this study was either aerobic or resistance training alone improves glycemic control in type 2 diabetes, but the improvements are greatest with combined aerobic and resistance training. And how about this study published in the prestigious Journal of the American Medical Association? They concluded among patients with type 2 diabetes, a combination of aerobic and resistance training compared with the non-exercise control group improved hemoglobin A1C levels. This was not achieved by aerobic or resistance training alone. So what they found was that the combination, the two, were better than either alone. And here is the third study where they concluded the combination of resistance and aerobic exercise was the optimal exercise strategy. So at this point, if you remember nothing else from this talk, the thing to remember is that the best strategy and why wouldn't you want the best for yourself? The best strategy is not resistance alone. It's not aerobic alone. It is the combination of the two along with proper diet, which will best help you beat this disease. Now these studies, surprisingly, did not use any special newfangled equipment. In fact, they used equipment which could be found in most gyms. In fact, they used equipment that are called 
colloquially Nautilus equipment or plate selection weight resistance equipment. So this type of equipment, the important aspect is you can select the resistance level. So while there's nothing special in particular about the equipment they used, they used a methodology and a theory, which we'll talk about later. The equipment they used and the method they used, I put together in a book, which can be found on Amazon, called The First Program. But the book and the exercise equipment is not enough. You need proper diet because you can't exercise your way out of a bad diet and you need trainers, somebody who's knowledgeable to tell you how to do an exercise correctly so you don't hurt yourself as well as to help you get over the little adversities that typically arise in training. And of course you need the guidance of someone who is a trusted medical advisor. These things are all together part and parcel of how you're going to beat this disease, prediabetes and diabetes. When I get to this part in the presentation, usually the reaction I get is, how come I've never heard of these things before? So you have to remember I'm a pathologist, and what doctors usually say about pathologists is that we know everything, but only too late. Well, the reason why we know a lot is because we spend a lot of time reading and we understand basic science, especially when it pertains to how diseases arise. So the research literature is filled with a great deal about insulin resistance. When people say, I don't know what is insulin resistance, that's because we haven't done a good job of explaining what is insulin resistance. So from someone who reads a lot of medical literature, I see my role as a translator. What I hope to explain to you in the next couple slides is what is insulin resistance. Let's take a moment, shall we, to examine all the diseases that are associated with insulin resistance. I think you'll find it very surprising, as most people do, when they see that not just diabetes is associated with insulin resistance, but pretty much all the diseases that we associate with getting older high blood pressure or hypertension, strokes, cataracts, fatty liver, gallstone, gout, and many cancers that are prevalent such as breast cancer, endometrial cancer, and colon cancer. All these diseases or conditions are caused by or are associated with insulin resistance because insulin resistance is a metabolic disease. By metabolic disease, we mean that a disease is caused because it's associated with how the body uses energy. Energy is metabolism. That's why when we get older, we notice our slowing metabolism. And that is related to insulin resistance. Many of you know that insulin is a hormone secreted by the pancreas. And this hormone travels far and wide throughout the body to regulate not just glucose, but fat and other functions regarding energy within the body. So insulin controls metabolism. And insulin resistance means the lack of responsiveness of cells to the signal insulin, the conductor. So if insulin is resistant in blood vessels, it leads to high blood pressure. Insulin resistance in the fat tissue results in problems with fat levels within the body. So insulin resistance gradually increases over time. And that means insulin levels need to increase to produce the same response. So it's an upward spiral of ever increasing insulin levels to achieve the same level of response. That's what insulin resistance leads to higher and higher insulin levels. In the last slide, we saw rising insulin levels. If we look at this slide, we'll see that it's divided into three separate segments. So that rising insulin level that we saw in the previous slide indicates that first third that we see. In other words, going from normal and that yellow line of insulin going up and up and up and up. We call that period hyperinsulinemia, meaning high levels of insulin in the bloodstream. 
So these levels of insulin can increase up to eight times or 10 times the normal level. But if you see the blue line, glucose, it is relatively flat during this time because the body is able to establish the same response from the cells but at the cost of higher insulin levels. The higher cost is measured in this purple line, insulin resistance. So for those of us who have hyperinsulinemia, we don't know that until we measure insulin levels and that's not normally done. It's only until we reach the phase of prediabetes. And in prediabetes, we notice that the blood sugar, the fasting blood sugar, is over 100. And it's during this time that the body has basically given up. It can't keep up with the insulin production required, demanded by insulin resistance. So glucose begins to rise, but at the same time, unfortunately, the pancreas begins to fail. And the cells in the pancreas begin to die off because they simply can't keep up. What we see at a certain point is the glucose goes up from a fasting of 100 to 125 fasting, or that the oral glucose tolerance test or the hemoglobin A1C exceeds the level which we then call diabetes. So I'd like to bring to your attention that the difference between prediabetes and diabetes is not a simple cutoff. We just make it a simple cutoff, but it is a continuum of the same disease. Diabetes, unfortunately, in advanced stages of type 2 diabetes, type 2 diabetes become essentially type 1 diabetics because enough cells of the type 2 diabetics, the beta cells in their pancreas die off so that they cannot put out much insulin at all. And approximately 70 to 80% of all diabetics will eventually reach this stage in which they will need to inject insulin. The best stage to intervene is the pre-diabetic stage or even earlier. We can reverse the disease in early diabetes, but it gets increasingly difficult. Can you pick out the guy who just got diagnosed with pre-diabetes and this guy just woke up and he thinks it's the middle of the ball game. But for those of us who know about insulin resistance, they know it's not the beginning of the game. It's the middle of the game. And in fact, it's not the time to put in a half-hearted effort. It's the best time to put in the best effort. And that's because we don't have good medications for prediabetes. In fact, we don't have good medications for diabetes because none of the medications we have arrest diabetes. Diabetes remains a progressive disease. So this is a take home message. If you're diagnosed with prediabetes, this is the best time to call in your best relievers, put through your best effort, and beat this disease. We're going to change gears now and talk about something that happens to everyone, not just those who get prediabetes. Sarcopenia. Sarcopenia comes from two words, sarco, which means muscle, and penia means less muscle. Over the course of normal aging, and this begins before the age of 50, more likely around the age of 30 and thereafter, our muscles begin to shrink in size. Even though from the outside, it looks like our legs might be the same as shown in this MRI photo, inside that gray portion, the muscle is actually shrinking. And it's not the muscle is turning into fat, it's that the fat is expanding to take up the space that the muscle once did. Now at the advanced stages of sarcopenia, older people typically experience the loss of stamina, increasing difficulty getting up from chairs or climbing stairs, and loss of energy. And this is the result of loss of type 2 muscle fibers. Now there's two types of muscle fibers. This is something you actually know. If you eat chicken or turkey, then you know dark meat and white meat. Dark meat is a type of meat that you'll see on the legs. And white meat is that type of muscle fiber predominant meat that you find on the breast part. And if you think about it for a moment, the legs have to support the weight. And so it's what we call fast twitch or type 2 muscle fibers. Whereas the type of muscle fiber that you find that supports the chest, which has to have stamina, 
is type 1 muscle fiber or slow twitch muscle fiber. Muscle is a mixture of these two muscle fibers. Every muscle, with some exceptions, has both muscle fiber types. They're all interwoven into like a mosaic as shown in this checkerboard. The type 1 muscle fiber has stamina. It is slower in its response time and its energy is typically supplied by fat. That is fat in the bloodstream. Whereas type 2 muscle fiber is responsible for our strength, our fast response time, and derives most of its energy from sugars, which may be within the muscle or outside the muscle. So if we're to consider the potential peak of our skeletal muscle mass, or total amount of skeletal muscle we might have throughout a lifetime, it peaks at around 30, and it slowly declines thereafter. But what we can control is the slope of this decline. Depending upon how you exercise, this slope can be shallow or it can be steep. Whether it's shallow or steep is very important because it will determine how you spend the last third of your life. And it will also determine if you have diabetes or prediabetes, whether you can beat this disease or not. Because skeletal muscle is the organ in which you can So if we're to consider the potential peak of our skeletal muscle mass, or total amount of skeletal muscle we might have throughout a lifetime, it peaks at around 30, and it slowly declines thereafter. But what we can control is the slope of this decline. Depending upon how you exercise, this slope can be shallow or it can be steep. Whether it's shallow or steep is very important because it will determine how you spend the last third of your life. And it will also determine if you have diabetes or prediabetes whether you can beat this disease or not because skeletal muscle is the organ in which you can reverse insulin resistance. So here's a somewhat technical slide but I think we can understand it. Basically it shows four consecutive steps beginning with where insulin docks with the insulin receptor and then it goes through step two and step three until step four in which GLUT4 pump pumps glucose into the cell. Insulin resistance, it's thought, occurs at the second step. But here's the main reason why I'm showing this rather technical slide. Exercise can bypass the blockage. It's pretty magical but it's especially in the muscle it's the only thing that we know of that can reverse insulin resistance. And because muscle is the largest metabolic organ, reversing insulin resistance in the muscle can lead the way for the rest of the organs in the body to reverse insulin resistance. Now we can begin pulling this all together. Because there's two muscle types, type one and type two, you need two exercise types to beat insulin resistance. Type one muscle exercise, commonly known as aerobic exercise, is endurance type exercise, whereas type 2 muscle exercise is resistance type exercise. The two types of exercises exercise two different types of muscle fiber. That's why the studies that we saw at the beginning showed the best results for reversing prediabetes and diabetes was the combination of the two exercise types. It's that simple. Now before we go on, it's important to dispel the mythology that surrounds exercise. Because if we don't, we will misunderstand what comes next. There is no such thing as cardio exercise. And to understand that requires a simple thought experiment. Imagine a motor, an electric motor, that turns a belt drive. And this belt drive turns a grinding stone. This grinding stone, if it's large, makes the electric motor work harder to turn. We can imagine this grindstone like our metabolism. So if our grindstone is heavy or big, then it causes our motor to work hard. And maybe our motor will overheat with time. We can imagine this motor is like our heart. So if the grindstone becomes lighter, then the load on our heart becomes lighter. And then our motor is less likely to overheat. So if we were to exercise, our heart beats faster, our lungs beat faster, and our muscles contract, and our sugars improve, and our blood fats level improve. 
what's actually causing that change? Is it the heart? I don't think so. Even though my cardiology colleagues would like to claim credit, the heart is a pump. Is it the lungs? No. The lungs exchange carbon dioxide for oxygen. That doesn't necessarily improve with exercise. It's the muscle. The muscle is the unsung hero of our metabolism. The difference between the two exercises is whether it uses an aerobic energy system or an anaerobic energy system. Whether it uses a type 1 muscle fiber, which is associated with aerobic system or a type 2 which is associated with our anaerobic system. Go into most fitness facilities and you'll see people doing mostly this. Walking on treadmills, jogging on treadmills, or even running on treadmills. If they're trying to lose weight then they're testing the most fuel efficient system developed. As many of you know, the animal who can go the furthest in the animal kingdom is the human being. And that is because we have evolved a system by which we are incredibly fuel efficient. When traveling at a constant rate of speed, we are able to extract the most energy when doing aerobic exercise out of every last fat calorie. Don't take my word for it, let's just look at the treadmill readout. This person has been running for 30 minutes at an extremely brisk rate of a six minute mile. And during this time, over half an hour, they've expended 681 calories. Now, 3,500 calories, fat calories, are necessary to be burned per pound of weight loss. So if we were to divide 3,500 by 681, it's not hard to see it would take between six and seven days of this relatively strenuous level of aerobic exercise to lose a pound. So now is when things get a little bit counterintuitive. Imagine you're going to a rental agency and you want to rent a car. Now your goal is not to go farthest with the least amount of gas. Your goal actually is the opposite. You're trying to burn as much gas as possible and be as energy inefficient as possible because remember your goal is to lose weight. So which rental car are you going to choose? Are you going to choose something which is like the Prius? Something which is highly energy efficient to get the most miles per gallon? No. If you want to lose weight, you're going to choose the biggest SUV on the lot the one which gets the worst gas mileage. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to knock aerobic exercise for weight loss. What I'm trying to tell you is that we generally have it incomplete. If your goal is to reverse insulin resistance or lose weight, you need to improve the composition of the muscle that needs the most improvement. And we learned earlier that sarcopenia or the loss of muscle occurs with aging. And it should come as no surprise that type 2 muscle fibers through sarcopenia are the ones which need to be increased the most. The way to do that is through resistance training. Here's where it gets very interesting. Let's look at a study that was done on 60 to 70 year olds. This is a study that was done over a half year period in which they measured the total energy expenditure before and after training. And you can see this is the energy expenditure just for resistance training. So on the left, you see their total energy expenditure pre-training. This is over a 24 hour period of time. And if you compare that to the total energy expenditure after training, you'll see that the stack on the right is higher. The stack on the right is not higher, mostly because of the resistance training. That small slab of black on the very top, which has just 215 kilojoules of added energy, which was the result of lifting some iron plates up and down a few inches. The great majority of the expenditure came after the lifting session. So this is the type of exercise you want. A little bit of work in the gym, not more than 20 or 30 minutes, and you want to be able to burn calories throughout the day. 
And that's not just the day you're doing the exercise, but the day afterwards. I took the liberty of massaging this data into a pie chart. And this pie chart shows the purple area being the resistance training energy expenditure. Please notice that for every one unit that was done resistance training, there were 3.5 extra bonus expenditure units that came after the exercise. And this energy expenditure came from building the new muscle after exercise. It came from the extra expenditure for maintaining the muscle afterwards, as well as other factors which we can account for bonuses from being stronger and having a more efficient muscle. Here's another concept which bears looking at. Imagine you have one of those Greek style boats with two rows of oars. On the lower layer, you have a team that always has its oars in the water. These are like the type one muscle fibers. They're always pulling and driving the boat forward. The ones on the upper deck, the type two muscle fibers, aren't ever called to pull the boat unless there's a heavy load. So over time, these guys get increasingly lazy because they never hear the call of the coxswain asking him to pull harder. I want you to consider this. When during daily life do we ever call upon our muscles to pull 100%? Practically never. So that's the purpose of strength training. Proper strength training asks us to try 100%. And as a result of trying 100%, nerve fibers begin to connect to those muscle fibers. That's right. As we get older, those nerve fibers, which don't connect to type two muscle fibers, gradually disconnect. And when they disconnect, the muscle fibers atrophy. So we can make those muscle fibers reconnect, giving us faster reflexes and making us stronger. As a pathologist, I've had the privilege of having an intimate look at the internal workings of people's bodies. Let me share with you some of the insight I have about muscle. You can gain the same insight by just having a good look next time you're at the meat counter. Take a look at a cut of meat taken from the active part of the cow and compare that with the part of the cow which is relatively inactive, which happens to be a very expensive cut of meat. The expensive cut of meat tastes good because it's marbled with fat. However, this expensive cut of meat is expensive to us metabolically. This muscle doesn't process fats nor sugars very well. If I saw this in our body, it would mean this muscle is probably insulin resistant. But we can get rid of that fat. We can convert that low quality of meat to a high quality of meat. And so that this properly exercised and insulin sensitive muscle now can teach the rest of the body how to become insulin sensitive. Let's take a moment and talk about the proper amount of protein one should take if your goal is to increase your muscle quality and mass. The US RDA of 0.8 grams per kilogram is a number designed to prevent malnutrition. It is completely different from the recommendation if you plan to thrive. Consider this. The liver is used by the body to store carbohydrates. The body stores fat in adipose tissue. Where does the body store protein? The body stores protein in muscle. So if you have more muscle, you have a greater storehouse of protein. The International Society of Sports Nutrition says that for those who want to build muscle, they should probably be eating in the range of approximately 1.4 to 1.8 grams per kilogram. Translated into grams per pound, that's about three quarters of a gram per pound. For example, somebody who is 135 pounds should eat approximately 100 grams of protein per day. If you have liver or kidney problems, consult with a qualified physician or healthcare provider before increasing your protein intake. Now, for some of us, that doesn't sound like a lot of protein. But hold on a minute. Four ounces of chicken breast is not the same as four ounces of protein. In fact, you have roughly have to divide by four to get the equal amount of protein. So a four ounce cut of chicken breast gives us only 28 grams of protein. 
Likewise, a quarter pound burger patty will give us 25 grams of protein and an egg approximately 5 grams of protein. Try this one day. Add up all the protein that you ingest throughout the day and see if you even come close. It's pretty tough without paying attention. Many of us are actually not getting enough protein to build muscle. I've saved the most important reason for this slide. Many of us in the second half of our lives combine inadequate protein intake with aerobic only exercise. This is a prime recipe for sarcopenia. Sarcopenia occurs in this negative feedback loop. In other words, people feel as if they have less muscle mass and therefore it takes more effort to do the same activity. Therefore they cut back on their activities, which leads to lower muscle mass and worsening sarcopenia. This downward spiral occurs especially in those who only do aerobic exercise and is especially accelerated in the presence of inadequate protein intake. This is especially important because there's a physiologic phenomenon among mature adults. It takes more protein ingestion compared to younger people to get the same muscle growth response. Older adults must be especially vigilant about getting enough protein in their diet. Exercise is medicine. That's not just a slogan. It's a truth, especially for those who are pre-diabetic or in early phases of diabetes. No other medication can do what combined aerobic and strength training can do to reverse and correct the underlying problems that exist in our metabolism for this disease. For strength training, the best exercise is individualized. Your goals, your ability, and progressively challenging. Strength training is best done on an individual basis. That's because you may have a history of prior injuries that might limit you from doing a particular type of exercise. You might be stronger in one area versus someone else. Doing a strength training class where it's not individualized is like giving a medication without individualizing the dose. We don't practice medicine like that by and large and I wouldn't advise you to do the same when it comes to optimizing your strength training. Although time doesn't permit me to get into the details of specific strength training techniques best to treat prediabetes and diabetes, the principles of progressive weight training apply here. Progressive weight training is a method used by professional athletes and it works for everyone without exception. Let's take a few minutes to explain how it works. Imagine you are on this level line on the left. When you begin training a muscle, you apply a certain stimulus. In other words, you challenge the muscle by making it work. This causes micro tears, very small microscopic tears in the muscle and actually causes the muscle to be weaker after the session compared with before. But the body sees this and says, oh, you've challenged me and I need to be better equipped next time. So over the course of the next day, two days, three and even four days, depending upon your metabolism, your body will repair those micro tears, make the muscle stronger, faster, and connected to more nerves. After a sufficient period of rest, your muscle is actually stronger than it was before. And this time, you might challenge the muscle again, perhaps with slightly more weight, slightly more repetitions, or perhaps with less rest between the set. In either case, the muscle again becomes slightly torn, but again rebuilds over this period of time to be even stronger than before. And this results over a succession of small calibrated increases in challenges to the muscle and improved not just larger, but higher quality muscle that can metabolize sugars and fats much better. Let me conclude with a word of caution and a word of encouragement. Exercise has certain risks and comes with a slightly elevated risk of sudden heart event during exercise. However, this is more than made up by the long-term benefits of improved health. Weight training is actually safer for the heart than aerobic exercise. That said, I don't know your condition and if you have any questions, please see a qualified physician or physical therapist or trainer before contemplating any regimen. If you would like to learn more about the subject, 
or you feel you may benefit from learning more, I have included the link to Amazon in the description below. Alternatively, you may wish to find a trainer who is familiar with diabetes or prediabetes rehabilitation. Thanks for your attention. Live strong and prosper.